Hello, I'm Sarah Campbell. Thank you for joining us on BBC News. Russia has launched one of its biggest aerial attacks on Ukraine since the war began, killing at least 18 people in a wave of deadly explosions across the country. President Vladimir Zelensky says 114 of 158 missiles and drones fired were shot down by Ukrainian defences. Ukraine's Air Force says it has never seen so many locations targeted simultaneously. Cities hit include Kyiv, Lviv in the west, Odessa in the south, and Dnipro, Kharkiv and Zaporizhia in the eastern Ukraine. A maternity hospital and shopping mall were among buildings damaged and destroyed. And Poland says a search is underway after an unidentified aerial object entered the NATO country's airspace from the direction of Ukraine at Hrubyasov. Poland's president has called an emergency meeting of security chiefs. From Kyiv, our Ukraine correspondent James Waterhouse reports. It is, and always has been, the whole of Ukraine which is under attack. Kyiv is still Moscow's biggest prize. Air defences have improved here, but this attack proved too much. I was woken up at half past seven by a horrible sound. It was so frightening. The missile was flying and everything was buzzing, so noisy. You are left in no doubt that this was a direct missile strike. The scale of the damage, the size of the blast zone, the heat caused. You're more used to seeing damage caused from falling debris when a missile is intercepted, but this reflects the scale of this Russian attack. And scenes like this are being replicated right across Ukraine. A lucky escape in Kharkiv in the northeast. This city is familiar with missile strikes, but not 20 in a single morning. A shopping centre in Dnipro in the east, as well as a maternity hospital, were hit. It didn't stop there. This is the port city of Odessa in the south, where a residential block was struck. Even in Lviv in the west, which is usually spared the worst of this invasion, wasn't immune this time. Ukraine's air force says it has never seen so many missiles. In a war where Moscow routinely strikes cities it can't occupy, that is saying something. Well, joining me now is Olga Ifshina from the BBC's Russian service. Uh, hello to you, Olga. I mean, we saw there from James's report the intensity, the scale of these attacks hasn't been seen for many, many months. Death and injury toll has been rising throughout the past few hours. What's the latest that you can tell us? Uh, yes, the death toll is, is rising almost every hour, unfortunately. And I think it's a very sad and very somber reminder of ambitions of Mr. Putin and of the fact that this war is far from being over and far from being quiet. Uh, despite the uh, the standstill, so, so to say, on the front line, we, we haven't seen any sufficient breakthroughs in the past few months. But uh, this strike shows that Putin uh, Putin's ambitions are still there. And also this shows... Um, the thought which some experts have been voicing for a while that Russia may be preparing for more strikes in winter because this winter strikes, they, uh, they put more pressure on Ukrainian infrastructure, on the Ukrainian economy, also on the uh, psychology of ordinary Ukrainians. They make day-to-day uh, -day life way hard, especially bearing in mind that it's um, you know, very cold currently in Kiev, it's minus temperatures, and also for Putin's uh, audience, so to say, in Russia. Russia, it also sends a message that he is still in the game, he still has those ambitions, and maybe uh, he tries to project an image that he is still in control, especially for the audience within the country. Because if you ask ordinary Russians, there is not, not that much for them to remember uh, in, uh, during this 2023 year. And these strikes may just, he hopes, may project an image that he is still strong because next year he has a presidential elections come. OK, Olga Ifshina from the BBC's Russian service, thank you. Uh, joining me now is Dr Precious Chatterjee Doody, Senior Lecturer in Politics and International Studies at the Open University. Um, hello to you, thank you uh, for your time. What do you make of the timing of this? Well, the timing's very interesting because the sort of immediate timing is directly after a pretty dramatic Ukrainian hit on a Russian warship in Crimea, which unusually... Um, the Russian leadership did acknowledge had happened. But of course, the sheer scale and coordinated nature of these missile attacks makes it, cl makes it clear that it's been 
uh, in the offing for quite some time. So I think it's part of a, a broader trend with the Russian leadership to attempt to attack um, infrastructural targets right at the, the, the worst point of winter, um, both to make sure that they have the, the greatest impact um, in a practical sense, but also to create a sort of psychological resonance because people will be struggling with the aftermath of this attack, of course. And also coming a, a day after uh, the US Congress signed off, what at the moment might be the last uh, significant aid package? And uh, it's interesting, isn't it, that the US ambassador in Ukraine has, has basically pointed to this and said this is why more funding is needed. Yeah, precisely. Now, obviously, uh, the Russian leadership has been very closely watching the internal debates in the US and um, funding issues are very much closely tied to US domestic politics. But it's very clear that if um, further support is not forthcoming, then Ukraine is going to absolutely struggle and its success in the war is very much contingent on that support. Um, so it's, it's clear that Russia is watching that very, very closely. As we go into 2024, um, how would you assess the situation here? We're approaching the what, second anniversary of the big, beginning of hostilities. Um, it's, it's difficult to, um, I guess, give a prognosis about how this is likely to pan out because there are so many variables at risk. Now, obviously, Ukraine has put up a far greater um, resistance to the Russian aggression than would have been imagined beforehand, I think. Um, that's partly because of the, you know, the absolute resolute nature of the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian leadership and their ability to um, generate significant social support. But also, uh, it's down to massive international support and it is contingent on that. Now, we've heard recent um, comments uh, from the Russian side about their ongoing commitment to the war. They're making a a really big attempt to try and portray the continuation of the war as a, basically a continual trajectory that they set out with aims of the so-called denazification of Ukraine. Essentially, they want to change Ukraine's leadership to a friendlier one. Um, and they're basically playing um, the line over and over that this will not change, that the war will not end until they've achieved those objectives, um, but they that they are making um, significant inroads now. And that's the main line that we're seeing on Russian state TV. So it's clear that they're in it for the long haul, that they want to keep sight of those initial objectives. For Ukraine, of course, the, the key objective is, is keeping its own sovereignty and its own independence. And that really is a fight for survival. So, you know, in, in that way, things haven't changed, despite the fact that we're now running into the second year anniversary of the war. And in terms of the psychological impact on the Ukrainian people, um, such a widespread attack um, as this today, people presumably uh, worried that um, the feeling that, that, that nowhere effectively is out of range. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Now, we know that um, the Russian leadership very often does calibrate its tactics its attacks for what I would call a kind of mm, maximal like cinematic effect almost. So we've seen this wide range of attacks that makes it clear that nowhere in the country is safe. Um, and we also, you know, the timing apart from being important in terms of strategic aims, it comes as Ukraine celebrating Christmas according to a Western calendar rather than uh, the Orthodox calendar. That's significant too in a symbolic sense because that kind of hints at this rupture between Ukraine and Russia and Ukraine um, westward facing orientation now. So all of this is really important, I think, for it, it's essentially creating that um, clear line that, you know, this is a, a, a it's about keeping Ukraine within Russia's orbit. Um, and for Ukrainians, it's absolutely about exerting that independence. But no, they're not going to be feeling at all secure now. I think it's really made quite a significant impact psychologically. OK, Dr. Precious, Chastity Judy, thank you so much for your time.